Hello, I am Jeffrey Zeldman from an event apart, the UX and front end conference for web professionals. And I'm here today with Mr. David Dylan Thomas, the author of Design for Cognitive Bias. Hi, David. Hi, thanks for having me. A pleasure. David will be speaking at Event Apart's Fall Summit 2020, which is three days of peace, love, front end, and UX, taking place October 26th to 28th. And David, your talk, like your book, is titled Design for Cognitive Bias. Yes. So first off, whose biases are we talking about? The customers, the stakeholders, the designers? All of the above. In fact, uh, you just listed how the book breaks it out. So we talk about our users' biases and how design or content strategy can mitigate those or sometimes use them for good. We're going to talk about our stakeholders and our bosses' biases and how understanding them can help us communicate and get things done. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we're going to talk about our own biases, which are really the most dangerous ones for our users and how to create processes to mitigate those. What is bias and, and why do we have it? So bias is just a fancy word for a shortcut your mind takes just to get through the day. Um, we have to make something like a trillion decisions a day. Even right now I'm making decisions about how fast to talk and where to look and what to do with my hands. And if I thought carefully about every single one of those decisions, I'd never get anything done. So it's a good thing that for the most part, our lives are on autopilot, but every now and then those shortcuts lead to errors and we call those errors biases. Okay, but, but users are rational, correct? <laughs> if only. Yeah, um, users, users are, are it's, it's a, the myth, I call it the myth of the rational user. Um, users are making 95% of their decisions below the threshold of conscious thought, right? So they're making decisions and aren't aware that they've made them until later when their mind kind of tricks them into thinking that they were being rational all along. Um, so when we're designing, right, our designs are influencing in part that 95% uh, of thinking that users don't even realize they're doing, which I think gives us a really, you know, awesome responsibility to make sure that we're, we're doing that thoughtfully. Well, so I get bias, like some people don't like other groups of people, stereotype them, whatever. But if I'm a user, you filling out information on a web form, how does bias even, you know, and I'm not looking at pictures of anybody or being asked to make guesses about their personality. How does bias even enter into something like that? Sure. So let's say you're a hiring manager and you're going through a LinkedIn page to try to figure out who you should hire for a web developer job. Um, you may be a person who is very woke, who is very, you know, conscious and progressive and voted for Hillary and voted for Obama. Um, but uh, if you see a name at the top of that page that doesn't fit what your pattern is for a web developer, which in a lot of cases is basically a skinny white dude, um, you might start to look more critically at that resume, at that LinkedIn page than you would otherwise. And we've seen this again and again in experiments with two identical resumes. The one with the male name tends to do better. Um, and again, it's not because you explicitly think men are better at this job, but you have a pattern that you've built up your whole life. So having that name at the top of the resume or at the top of that LinkedIn page is a design choice, right? Um, and we have to ask ourselves, is that information, is that design choice helping our user make a good decision or is it in fact getting in the way of our user making a good decision? So then we start to explore, maybe we remove the name, maybe we remove the name of the college they went to or other things that might be unduly influencing and focus in on just the relevant information, which if you think about it is good design to begin with, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, there's a bias level to that as well. What about, say, someone watching this works at an, is a web developer at an insurance company or, or a designer at a university? How does designing for cognitive bias, how, do they, how, does that, how does that fit into their job? Sorry, say that one more time. Okay, so I, you're talking about a hiring decision. Mm -hmm. where someone reacts to like an African sounding name and goes unconsciously goes, I'm not going to hire that person, even mm -hmm. though they think they're liberal. Okay. That's a one example, but I'm talking about like someone's buying a cheese grater at an e-commerce on an e-commerce page or someone's making a decision about which class to take. And it doesn't, you know, between, uh, two, two like, um, 
they're on a college website looking at two different uh what do you call the classes that that don't really count toward your grade point average? oh like electives yeah they're looking at two different electives one is you know how does bias enter into all that Those so so one of the things that it, it, it is hard for us to get our head around is that there is no such thing as neutral design. So something, whether I intentionally, let's say it's three different classes you're choosing from, how I have designed that page, even the order in which I present those classes is going to influence how you decide. There's a bias called um, serial position effect where the first thing and the last thing tend to be more memorable than the thing in the middle, right? Um, so even if I'm not intentionally trying to influence your decision, um, you being a human being looking at that site are going to bring your biases and your ways of, of interpreting information to that experience. So again, it's, it's on me to make sure that as much as possible, I'm at least aware of what you're bringing to that experience so that I can maybe be careful about which thing goes first and make sure that that is not going to give you an undue emphasis on that thing. In fact, Amazon dealt with this with their reviews, where in the old days, uh, the most recent review would go first. And people would assume that was the best review simply because it was first, but it was really just the most recent one. And so they eventually added a level where it's the most recent positive review right next to the most recent, um, or no, sorry, the most helpful, because they invented helpfulness, the most helpful positive review next to the most helpful negative review, giving them equal visual weight, which forced you, the user, to give them equal sort of authoritative weight. So it's those kinds of- balanced. Yeah, exactly. So it's as if you had a friend there, a consultant going, well, it's a very lightweight vacuum cleaner, but the, the cost for the maintenance is very high. Like exactly. They're, they're, yeah, okay. Um, what about stakeholder bias? Mm. How, do we, how do we deal with it? Uh, not that you can do this all in our short conversation here, but just generally, how do you approach something like stakeholder bias and how do you get a stakeholder to agree even to let you be anti-bias in your thinking, or do you not even tell them that that's what you're doing? So the whole third chapter of the book really tries to dig into that question. And to, just to give you kind of a teaser of that, um, your stakeholders have just as many biases as you do, just as many biases as your user sure. does. Um, and so one of those, especially if you're working at a very conservative organization, is you know sort of risk aversion and loss aversion. And uh, loss aversion is where it hurts twice as much to lose $10, let's say, as it feels good to find, five, find $10. Um, we're much more uh, emotional about our losses. So ironically, when you're trying to help someone who is risk averse to make a risky choice, it's actually better to tell them about the downside of not making that choice. So if someone is using a lousy CMS and they're just sticking with it for years just out of habit, Rather than tell them how great it would be to get a new CMS, it can actually be more effective to tell them, if we stick with the CMS, here's how many people are going to quit. Here's how much money we're going to lose. Uh, here's how much it's going to cost to rehire people to replace those people, right? And that apocalyptic picture is actually more motivating for someone who's feeling risk averse uh, than someone um, than telling them how rosy it might be. That makes sense. In my own experience, I know that um, while I'd like to, for instance, when I would try to get a client interested in accessibility for its own sake, because you want to serve everyone, don't you? You want to welcome everyone, don't you? An inclusive message is, that doesn't necessarily move people the same way we could get sued if we don't yeah. do this. Unfortunately, is more motivating. Like, what's yeah. our risk? Oh, we don't want to. We don't want bad PR. We don't want bad news about our company. We don't want a lawsuit that we have to settle. Even you know, so so for. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that uh, fear of a negative outcome can unfortunately be more persuasive. Um, so I imagine your, your talk is uh, full of problems and solutions and tips. What are some surprises people might not be expecting in your talk? What are some surprises we may look forward to in your talk? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, the, 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 the spoiler is that it's actually a talk about design ethics, right? I'm going to sit here and rev revel you with tales of weird human quirks 
and weird ways the brain works uh, that are very amusing. Um, but at the end of what I'm going to hit you with is, oh, by the way, all of this is why we actually need to seriously talk about design ethics, why we need to take seriously the work of folks like the Design Justice Network, who are putting together principles that center the most vulnerable. Like, you think I'm here to sort of tell you some cool mind tricks, and I am, but all of that builds to, hey, guess what? Because we actually have this potentially undue influence on our users, we need to be acting very ethically and we need like rules and regulations and Hippocratic oaths and all the things other dangerous industries have adopted over hundreds of years of getting it wrong to be more safe and be more pro-social. So that I'd say is the big spoiler is like, gotcha, it's actually design ethics. <laughs> That's cool. And we're going to have several talks about ethics or that touch on ethics because I think at this point we all know I mean, I was euphoric when I first got into web design. I thought, oh, this tech is great and it's going to make, it's going to end illiteracy, end poverty, unemployed people will learn HTML. And now we know that there's a dark side to, to tech or, or a negative side to tech. Um, and we have to be aware of it, no matter what our intentions are, we have to be super mindful. So I think there's a lot of inherent interest in this topic right now. Um, earlier today, I was in an HR, uh, event, which was all about uh, bias as well, and just like avoiding bias and looking for bias and bias in hiring. I think everybody's very aware of it right now, which is great. This is a topic who I, I think this topic's time has come. I think if you tried to talk about this three years ago, which you probably did, people weren't maybe listening as hard as they are right now. Yeah, that's actually literally when I started giving this talk was 2017 at UX Copenhagen. And, you know, it was catching fire. But I mean, obviously, this year in particular, um, this has been top of mind for a lot of people. And we, you know, at a book apart, we actually kind of fast tracked <laughs> to make sure we could get this thing out even sooner, uh, because we wanted to make sure that people had, you know, this as a part of the conversation. You also have a podcast, do you not? Yeah, so that? part of the way I found my way to writing this book was doing a podcast called The Cognitive Bias Podcast, um, which I closed out earlier this year, but I'm bringing it back to sort of restart the conversation. But I really would just take one, uh, one cognitive bias per episode and just kind of flesh it out and then move on to the next one. People can, can find that and they like... Uh, it's all of the, uh, all, all of the podcast spaces. If you, if you just Google it, you'll, you'll see like 50 different ways to download it. Okay, so before the show and after the show, people can listen to the Cognitive Bias podcast. They can buy the uh, Designing for uh, Cognitive Bias. Design for Cognitive Bias, bias yeah. Why, why wasn't the book called Designing Against Cognitive Bias? So, so you know where that comes from. I, uh, a good friend of mine, is, uh, Derek Pawazek, who like literally in 2000 wrote the book on Design for Community. Design for Community. And a friend of mine too. This is um, what a small world. Yeah, awesome. and, 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 and so uh, that kind of just set a pattern in my mind, like that's my bias of like, oh, it's cool to call books designed for blank. And there's been a handful of those over the years. So really, honestly, that's where it comes from. Like even when I was naming the talk, I'm like, how about design for cognitive bias? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, and also honestly, cause it isn't always against bias, right? There are some biases that can actually be good for people. There are certain biases that make content more believable. And so if your message is wearing masks can save lives, if you have something in your design toolkit to make that more believable, use it. That's for the common good. So it's not always against. Design believability is something you address in the book as well. Yeah. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. So there's a number of studies that indicate if something is easier to read, like very clear, bright fonts, if it is plain language, easier to process, if it's if it rhymes, which makes it more memorable and easier to process, it becomes more believable. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where, okay, now that I know that, I need to be very thoughtful about what I choose to make rhyme. <laughs> so uh, Click It or Ticket, which was a campaign to try to increase seatbelt use, um, it rhymed, it was more memorable, and it was pro-social, it was saving lives. And it literally, I, I explained the math in the book, but it literally saved maybe 4,000 lives, right? Or at least contributed to that. So it's, it's important to know about that, that faculty of design. Wow, that's really cool. Um, I should pause here to say, uh, to talk about, again, the show is, uh, sorry, the show is uh, Atlanta Parts Fall Summit 2020. It's a three-day show. 
There's 18 speakers plus special guests, 22 people in all, uh, really interesting educators. The first 50 people to register will receive a free collection of eBooks written by some of our speakers, perhaps even including Mr. David Dylan Thomas. Um, and if you buy a three-day pass and receive, you, you will receive six months of on-demand access to our first three online together events, as well as the three-day event that you're buying a ticket for. So that's six full days of jam-packed content for the price of three days. How can you resist? Now, to, to wrap things up, I, I don't, just uh, how did you get into this particular topic area? And if you had like 10, 20 seconds to tell someone why it's important, what would you say? Uh, so I'll start with the last part first. Um, if you are a designer, part of your job is helping people make decisions. If you want to be good at your job, you need to really understand how people make decisions. And this book can help you do that. Um, how it's I got into it. It's a book about it, people. It's a book yes, about people. Exactly. Exactly. Design is about people. We design for people. We design with people. Um, we are people. <laughs> uh, so if you want to be good at that job, you need to know about people. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would say to that. Um, okay, as far great. as how I got into it, um, I saw a talk by Iris Bonnet called Gender Equality by Design, which really got into the pattern recognition part of bias. And I became immediately transfixed with the need to understand as much as I possibly could. So I literally studied one cognitive bias a day for like a year, <laughs> uh, became insufferable. And my friends were like, please just get a podcast. <laughs> and so I did that rather than bother them with it. And that kind of started me on that road. And I was already doing a lot of content strategy and UX work. So eventually those two things just kind of melded. Um, were you a writer at some point? Before so, yeah, I've been, a author? yeah, I mean, I've been writing all my life. Like I'm a content strategist and the content part came from doing writing and filmmaking ever since I was a kid. Um, I really discovered the web in 2000 and that's when like sort of the more the UX part of it came into it for me. But yeah, I've been writing my whole life, but I never wrote a book. And it's funny, I never intended to write a book, but I was giving this talk and Lisa Maria uh, Martin was in the crowd and later asked me, hey, ever thought about writing a book? And at the time, I was sort of like flippantly, yeah, sure, why not? And then later I found out, oh, right, she's the managing editor of A Book Apart. She was asking me a real question. I'm like, oh, yeah. let me get back to you, because that would be interesting. <laughs> you say you're a filmmaker as well? Oh, yeah, I've been making movies ever since I was a kid. Um, it doesn't pay as well as UX, so <laughs> I don't do it quite as frequently. But yeah, a couple of years ago, I made a, a web series about the Philadelphia tech scene called Developing Philly with my producing partner, Maurice Gaston. Uh, so I keep my hand in that as much as I can. Are these available anywhere, YouTube or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to my website, actually, DavidDillonThomas.com, you'll see a whole section at the bottom with the talks I give, the movies I make, all that good stuff. DavidDillonThomas.com. And if people want to follow you on Twitter, your handle there is different. Yeah, my, my handle is movie underscore pundit, P-U-N-D-I-T. Uh, again, going back to my days when I was doing like film criticism and stuff. But yeah, that's how you can find me there. So you went from filmmaking and film criticism to still doing some filmmaking, but basically mm -hmm. you're an author, you're a UX consultant, you're a content strategist. Um, yes. How's business? Uh, business is tough. Like I, th I think everyone is sort of learning how to adjust to life during COVID. I mean, I think Think Company has been, you know, very fortunate. They're very smart <laughs> about how to uh, position themselves so that, you know, we're, we're keeping everybody, you know, um, safe. And uh, we are finding that, you know, this is, this is when being good to your clients pays off because people are sticking with us because we've done well by them. So now they're doing well by us. So that, that, that's paying off. Um, I think now, actually, for my, my, my particular role, I'm shifting more towards um, inclusive design workshops and trying to help people get their heads around that as a, like an entree into building a more inclusive practice. Uh, so that's gaining traction right now. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think like everyone else, we're trying to weather the storm. I think you go back to your core principles. Yeah. Right? When things are tough, you just look at, we don't know what's going to happen. The future is very uncertain, but... We don't know who we are and what we value, and let's let's hold to those values really tightly now. Yeah, because that's what's going to get us through to the other side. So the topic is 
designed for cognitive bias. It's part of an event of parts, three day extravaganza, the fall summit 2020. David Dylan Thomas will be there. I will be there. I hope some of you will be there. And regardless, everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks.